In the last century, there were two major astronomic discoveries being made, um, which explained to us how the universe is working. One was people detected that um, galaxies are permanently moving apart from each other. If you now go back in time and transport this back in time, you see that galaxies have all one common origin, which people nowadays call the Big Bang. The second monitoring or measurement was that there's a microwave background radiation in the universe. If you trace this back again, you can say the back, back, Big Bang must have been very, very, very hot. At CERN, what we tried to do is we tried to reproduce those conditions one billionth of a second after the Big Bang by colliding particles. So what we do is we take protons, two of them, you smack them together with very high speed. And what you create at this very moment is a very, very high density, very high energetic um, conditions which are resembling the conditions a billionth of a second after the Big Bang, 30 and a half billion years ago. So what we do is we take the protons, we put them into bunches, we put them in the beams, and the beams are then something like a, like a chain of bunches. The bunches are all accelerated, uh, and an accelerator which you can see here on the picture. Um, this is a 27 kilometer long tunnel. Uh, on the left hand, on the right hand side, you can see the airport of Geneva. Gives you the scale, Lake Geneva on the top right, the Jura Mountains on the left right. And uh, what we do here is we collide the protons again and again and again, over and over again, and taking pictures of the collision. Which means that every time we take a picture of the collision, this picture gives us what happened something like 30 and a half billion years ago, which conditions were prevalent at the time. If you do this, we have digital cameras. One of them is 40 meters long, 20 meters in diameter. The other one is a little bit smaller. It's 23 uh, meters long and 60 meters in diameter. And in um, principle, this is how a collision is looking. Looking like you can see the collision is happening in the, in the center of this picture, and then thousands of debris is out of the collision coming out, and you, you, you take a picture of this one. It's the same thing with a car accident, where the police is coming in and then trying to figure out how the car accident was happening, and we're doing this with, with proton accidents. We're creating something like this uh, 40 million times a second, which means the raw, raw data rate is something like one petabyte per second. We're filtering the data down to something which you can digest in our computer center. And if you take the data, you can see here the data coming in. If you run this for a couple of years, then you accumulate the data, you analyze the data, and you might figure out after a couple of years that there are some things which theory cannot explain. Uh, you see here a, a small hump at, the, at 100, whatever it is. And this is then something which is giving um, the Nobel Prize to some physicists who are predicting this, who were predicting this 40 years ago. So this is our business model, very simple. Um, you need to have an apparatus for this. We call this a particle accelerator. This is how it's looking in, in the tunnel. You can see the curvature. Um, the blue tubes are more or less something which we call superconducting magnets, which are guiding the beams. The beams are all protons, which means positively charged. You need to have a magnet field around them to guide the beams and keep them into a small, very small beam pipe so they do not hit anything else. And this is where the challenges are starting. This is where the control systems are kicking in. We need to put something like 10,000 amps current into these magnets. They're superconducting cables, very, 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 very small. Um, but in order to be superconducting, you need to cool them down to minus 171 degrees Celsius, which is 1.9 degrees Kelvin. So you need to keep everything very cold, and you need to put 10,000 amps in. This is now the challenge, and the challenge is continued by the size of the beam. This is the, the euro. This is the currency which is at the moment going uh, downwind in Europe. Uh, you see Spain. Spain has a diameter of 4 millimeter. This is the size of the beam. So now this is the game. You steer a 4 millimeter wide beam in a beam pipe which is as big as this one, around 27 kilometers. And this you do 10,000 times a second. And you run this for the next 12 to 16 hours. If you take the beam, the energy in the beam is equivalent to 18 kilograms of TNT. Now you can think why I, why I named the slide controlling a Jedi laser saber. If this beam is getting lost in the machine, if this is somehow touching the beam pipe, it will open the beam pipe, it will go in the magnet, the magnet is cold because it's superconducting, the beam is hot, hot and cold do not work, so you will have something like a destruction of the magnets. Losing the beam in the machine is for us a disaster. And this is where security is kicking in. CIA. Confidentiality? Nada. There's nothing. All the design data of the LHC, our results, the paper, the data is more or less all public. You can download this from our web pages. If you want to build your own accelerator in the garden, if you've got a big garden, just go ahead. We're even willing to help you if you provide the funding. Integrity, this is more interesting. Integrity, safety, this is where we're getting interesting. We must, must avoid that the beam is hitting anything else than the other beam. If it's hitting the beam pipe, it's destruction. It's hitting the magnets, it's destruction, and so on. So this is where the control systems and the safety systems kick in to make sure that we have a very, very safe operation of the accelerator. A, availability. This is the next thing. Availability means we can run the beams 12 hours a day. 
and then seven days a week, 300 days a year. But if the beam is, for one, uh, one reason or another, not working properly, if the beam is misbehaving, we can afford just to dump the beam, get rid of the beam, and then we decrease the availability. But uh, this is one of the two safe states of the accelerator. One safe state is no beam in the machine. Everything is safe. The second safe state is a well-controlled controlled beam in the machine. And this is where the mess is starting. And this is where my five, actually six, challenges for computer security are kicking in. My first challenge is we have lots of accelerators. It's like a gearbox in your car. You cannot accelerate your car in the sixth gear. You need to have a first, second, and third gear. So we got a gearbox. We got different accelerators which are ramping up the beam speed to maximum speed. For this, we need to have control systems. We got control systems for power, electricity, very simple. High voltage, low voltage, 12 volts, 10,000 amps. We got control systems for cryogenics to cool the machine down. Cooling ventilation systems for cooling the systems. We got systems for creating the vacuum. We got monitoring system. We got safety systems. Nobody is supposed to be in the tunnel while the beam is on. So you need to have access control, making sure that there is nobody. You need to have fire detection, oxygen deficiency, gas detection. You need to have protection system against radiation because the beams radiate some, some, some radiation, which is called synchrotron light, some hard X-ray light, which you need to protect against and so on. So there are zillions and zillions of control systems. My count is there are 175 different control systems we're using for our accelerators. A control system for me in this terms is a couple of PLCs, a couple of servers, some HMIs. This is a small control system. The biggest control systems here are something like 1,000 PLCs, a cluster of 500 servers, and something a couple of dozen HMIs. So those are the different control systems we have. Schneider, Siemens, Homegrown, Linux, Lynx OS, um, different brands, homegrown, self-made custom, uh, custom boards, which electronics which we developed ourselves, and everything is interconnected. So this is a dependency graph of the control systems in for, for the LHC. And what you figure out is there are no choke points. Network cells, network segregation, I would love to do this. I would like to have a tree structure where the communication is coming from the front ends and somehow aggregated. But this is not working. The control systems are all interlocked with each other. The cryo systems need to talk to vacuum systems and so on. Which means that the huge cross dependencies is making my life for security much more difficult. I can't put in choke points. I can't put in network segregation as far as I would like to. Putting monitoring in is very, very difficult because I don't have the choke points where all the traffic can get through. If you're running an intrusion detection system, heuristic IDS is very, very difficult because even the traffic is not homogeneous. This depends on the state of the accelerators. And there are many accelerators which are pumping in parallel, which means that there's never a stable state. If you ramp up the beam, accelerate the beam, the network traffic is changing. If you're in collision mode, then the network traffic is different. And if you ramp down the magnets, if you end the data taking period, then the network traffic is different. So putting some heuristics and detecting anomalies in network traffic is very, very hard, if not even impossible. So this is my challenge number one, controlling network, understanding the network flow, seeing how the network is going and making network segregation. The good thing on this one is this is complex, which is also playing in my favor, because if you now want to attack and you make it down to the control systems, manipulating one control system is not sufficient. Because now you need to manipulate at least a couple, a dozen or even more of them. Because if one of them is not behaving properly, the others will kick in and say, oh, something is weird here. Get rid of the beam and everything is stable. So doing destruction is very, very hard, if not even impossible. In my previous life, I was doing safety. And I was doing safety analysis of the LHC. And um, this more or less, those analyses have shown that one or two or even five systems which are misbehaving are always covered by the other five or 125 systems in the rear. So very, very difficult. Complexity here is making my life for security very, very difficult in terms of monitoring, but it's also making my life easy because for the attacker, he has the same problem. If he wants to attack something successfully, he needs to have very, very in-depth knowledge. And I, I doubt that even at CERN, there are people who understand the full complexity as it's depicted in this graph. And then we got the computer center. Running the accelerators, you need to have a computer center behind. We got a computer center of 10,000 servers. Part of this computer center is exclusively used for running the accelerator. If you want to upload some configuration files, some thresholds, everything is coming from databases provided by the computer center. So the computer center is something like a very big demilitarized zone, which is acting between our office network and our controls network for the accelerators. The problem here is dependencies again. What we're doing is we're doing regular disco test. Uh, this has nothing to do with music. This is something like disconnecting our control systems completely away from the computer center and seeing whether all the dependencies are 
kept together in the controls network. And so far we succeeded. So we can run our systems without the computer center as a safety measure. So if some, something is going ad hoc in the computer center, we can just completely breach this. We can pull the plug and we have an independent controls network which is still allowed to, uh, able to, to pump itself. The next problem is the LHC is just one. There is no second LHC. If you want to build yourself one in, the, in, the, in, in, your, in your garden, just talk to me later. I will tell you how to get some funding and so on. Uh, I would be really keen on this. But this is a one one-time prototype, which makes it very, very difficult to have uh, test stands. We have a test stand on the top uh, left. This is the test stands for testing the magnets. But more or less, apart from this, we have very, very few test stands. We can't have, because most of the control systems are only working if you design your controls loop, understanding how the signal's coming in. They're only working when you have beam in the machine and if you have a high-speed beam in the machine, which means you need to have an LHC for developing, designing your control systems. So now this is a catch-22. And for this again, we cannot afford having test stands which we've just put outside. We're trying to have as many test stands as we can, but the last step always before you do a deployment of your controls system is you need to be on the real beam line with a real accelerator. This is my second challenge. We have not a clear split between development testing phase and operation maintenance phase. This is a melange. The developers need to have access for the real stuff, for the real machine. Which also implies that um, my bunch of 400 plus developers doing development in all different kinds of control systems need to be able to access the, the accelerator. If you look at the systems, um, there's permanent optimization. They're doing permanent development of the control systems. They're using technologies they deem to be appropriate for their use case. If you need to have something which is acting within picoseconds, you choose it accordingly. I cannot come up saying because of safety re or security reasons, you just use Java and you cannot do assembly anymore because Java is better or whatever. So the people can choose the technology. We have a very, very agile development, which also means that even during runtime, control systems are permanently changing because our developers are adapting the code, maintaining the code, improving the code, and then downloading the code to the machine to see whether they can optimize the treatment of the beam. In the past, even before this, we were using Office PCs, normal Windows XP Office PCs, and every developer in 2004 had direct access to the control systems on our, uh, on our controls, uh, controls network. This was a one-to-one -one link. Everybody was able to go there. For security, this is, of course, a disaster. Network segregation doesn't work. So what we did is we deployed network segregation and we split off all the developers from the real machine. With the consequence, they need to have remote access now for the do doing development from the office into the accelerator. We used Windows Terminal Service at the very beginning and we failed because lots of our control systems are based on Java. And if you've ever run a Java development engine, uh, Java Eclipse for example, in the terminal server, you figure out that you cannot run 10 sessions in parallel even if you have very, very powerful hardware. It doesn't fly and my developers were all going on the barricades and saying, come on Stefan, you fucked up, this doesn't work. We need to have something which is powerful. I do not want to see my mouse pointer following my thoughts after three seconds. This didn't scale. So we started with terminal servers, but we gave this up. We got a class of 150 terminal servers just for the purpose of development. Didn't fly. Now we have a cluster of 400 virtual machines. Every developer has its own virtual machine. The virtual machines do not see the internet. You cannot do, do um, emailing on those ones. They are disconnected, more or less. They are available for the developers to do their development. But now I'm kidding you with the next problem. They're doing permanent optimizations. They're doing an agile development. They would like to download some Java code, some, some libraries from the internet. So how do you do this now? I don't want to give them the internet because if they end up on the wrong machine, they infect the virtual machine which can see the accelerator network. I don't want to have that one. I'm still looking for a good solution for this one. At the moment, they have to have, in principle, two instances where they download the code and then they go to some kind, some kind of a quarantine zone where it's then uploaded to the accelerator sector. But this is tedious for developers. How many of you are doing development? Oh, not many. But think of this. You got an idea, you would like to download this, you would like to continue programming, but instead you cannot download or just copy paste this. You have to download this, it's going into the quarantine, some antivirus software is kicking in, and then it's getting onto your system and you get your coffee. This is annoying. And I got 400 of those people who are annoyed, and they are always annoyed of me. <coughs> what we're trying to do now is we're trying to move development out. We're trying to identify what is really core development, where do we need to replicate data sources so they can do the development in the corner without being able to, disc to connect directly to the accelerator? If you continue on this one, this is how on the operation, uh, on, on our control system, con control center is looking like. You've got four islands. The island on the right-hand side this is for the LHC. 
lots and lots of screens, lots and lots of status screens which are displaying the status of the LHC. It's operated 24 hours, seven, hours, seven days a week, more or less 300 days a year. The expertise for running the LHC, the expertise for building the LHC is a worldwide endeavor, which means that at this very moment, I got 1,150 plus experts sitting somewhere close to Geneva and the PDGX and the Geneva Basin, <coughs> some people sitting in Europe, but I got also experts which are sitting in California, in Beijing, in Japan. I got experts sitting in Russia. I can't fly them in if something is going wrong on the X-Rater. And the X-Rater is highly complex, so you would like to have an incident response, an, in, an, an immediate response if something is happening. So I need to provide permanent remote access for those developers and experts to go onto the control system to check the status and, if needed, to tweak and tune the settings. Fortunately, we get something which we call the machine uh, critical setting system, the machine protection system. So if you're really going into the meat and the safety systems, this you cannot do remotely. For this, you need to be in the control center. But everything else, remote access is another challenge for me. It is not like build up your plant, shut down your plant, and if the remote support needs to go in, you open a line and then they can call in. With us, they are permanently calling in. They need to have permanent access to go on the actuator and doing optimization, doing development from wherever they are. We tried to go for, for, for multi-factor authentication, but there was hitting the next two problems. Multi-factor authentication, at the moment, I'm not aware that there's a silver bullet. We using multi-factor authentication, so we came up with at least four tokens. One token is you're getting an SMS sent to your certain mobile phone. But I got a couple of people who are working in the US, working in Russia, working in China or in Japan. They don't have a certain mobile phone, so SMS doesn't work for them. The next thing is you use Google Authenticator. But believe me or not, there are people who just have a Nokia brick, which is not a smartphone, but just a phone where you can call. This is the in, in, uh, original idea of the telephones, making calls and maybe SMSs. So for those ones, Google Authenticator is not working. UB keys, USB keys for uh, as keyboard extensions. Try to use this on the iPad if you don't have the appropriate cable with you. You fail with this one. And last thing is smart cards and X509 certificates on the chip. If you have ever tried this on a Linux box, you see that you get a driver problem. It's not working stable. So we don't have a saver bullet. If you log in into one of our control systems, you need to go and you select your, your favorite choice. For Linux, the same thing. You can type one for Google Authenticator, two for an SMS, or three for the, three for the YubiKey. In theory, this is working perfectly. In practice, again, I got 400 plus developers, and they think this is too tedious for them. So now I'm more or less doing a psychological job and trying to convince them that multi-factor authentication is also in, in their interest, even if it means for them that they have to type more, that they have to do more. The next challenge is something which is also standard for a normal plant in, in, in normal industry. We do not have technical stops. If you look at the schedule here, it's starting on the top left of April. So April until mid of or end of May, we're trying to do commissioning, which means starting the accelerator with beams. The first technical stop is in June. Then we're running and doing collisions. The next technical stop is in September. Then we have the next technical stop, end of November, and then after end of December. We have just only four technical stops. Those four technical stops are not only just for patching the systems. This would be the occasions where you can patch. But you can't. Because those are the moments where everybody is rushing in and doing their last deployments when they do not want to do this during beam time. This is where the consoles, where the servers, where the computer centers are uh, needed the most. So stops are rare, and the DC, the data center, is essential at this very moment. So when can I do the patching if not during the technical stops? I cannot do it during runtime, and I cannot do it during, during technical stops. So I'm now in something like another catch-22. I don't have the time slot. Of course, now you can argue, why don't you assign the very first day always for patching? Because there are other things which are also of priority, and now you have to start balancing. So what we did is we delegated responsibility. I'm CERN computer security officer. I am not the person responsible for computer security at CERN. I declined this responsibility. What we did is we delegated the responsibility for security for everybody at CERN who is using digital things. If you come to CERN with your laptop, you have the right to connect your device to our network. Bring your own device. We do this since 20 years. It's your laptop. I'm not installing something on your laptop. I have no control on your laptop. If you want to run Windows 98, it's your business. You're responsible for security. If you fuck up and it's getting compromised, your business, you have to reinstall. This means also for the control system experts, they have to secure the systems themselves and the security team is helping them with doing the utmost. 
And then we're aiming for prompt patching. We're trying to be able to have agile patching, patching also in the control systems. We gave them some tools where they can do it more promptly. I still got 10 minutes, Mike. If you look at this, Java is becoming our, our most, most stringent problem. We are a Java shop. We're doing lots and lots of Java development. The problem which we're facing is Java has this, this end date of certain versions. Can you imagine this is good for clients? This is good for home users, which can patch more or less at any time. But for control systems, just being forced to patch everything by a date which is given by Adobe, this doesn't work. So what we did is we had to rewrite our own web Java web start application just to avoid this, this, this security blunder for control systems. Legacy, just one very quick slide. It's a pain. We've done Nessus scans in 2007 on all our control systems. 15% of the devices are just plainly failing. You send Nessus scan against PLCs, the LEDs are starting red, the LEDs are starting yellow, and the PLC is dead. And this was 2007. Do you think it's better today? No, it is not. We still have a lack of robustness. We got systems which we just ship in, we're getting, we're buying, and then we do some penetration testing and we figure out that this is a very nice device which is doing its job, it's doing its controls job, but security-wise, it's completely badly or zero in implemented. And this is why, because small vendors, they ignore security. They are not in security business. They are doing control systems, and then lots and lots of small vendors which are doing brilliant control systems but they don't have security experts to really improve the software of their, the security of their software. So I'm again, I'm trying, I'm trying, I'm trying to put security demands on our cat tenders. And the picture on the top right, you see uh, one of the, the 3D laser cutter machines. This cost one and a half million. It's a very beautiful machine. It can cut uh, very, very thick steel plates and then uh, form them. It has a small panel with Windows XP. And now asking for some security measures of prompt patching of a patch cycle antivirus software, the vendor will just tell you, I'm sorry, I can't provide you with this one, which means we cannot buy. But if we cannot buy, we cannot have machinery, so we cannot advance. So now I got another catch-22. I would like to make things done. I would like to be able to have control systems to produce something. And then I'm just getting stuff which is not secure enough. On the, top, uh, on the bottom left, this is a dosimeter reader. 70 seconds, it took one of my guys to infiltrate in this dosimeter reader, do a TFTP download of the core dump, and finding the telnet password inside in clear text. Boom. The other one is a power supply. It has an Ethernet port, something like 50 seconds denial of service attack against this uh, um, network port, and the device is dead. You can start switching the buttons, but this doesn't help you anymore because the device is dead and you have to pull the plug. We got thousands of those ones. How many students do I need to run around and pull the plug of thousands of those, those devices if they all crashed? This doesn't fly. So again, we are pen testing everything, doing NASA's, doing, doing penetration testing with, with dedicated experts. Uh, at the moment, I have to uh, admit, NMAP versus LHC, 1-0. We were doing permanent NMAP scans on our controls network until the moment where one NMAP scan was uh, dumping the beam linking it uh, an alert and then the beam was more or less automatically ejected because one of the processes, one of the control systems was blocked by the NMAP scan. There was too much traffic for the, for the network port and then the control process went slow. It was too slow so the interlock systems kicked in, the safety system said something is at odd, let's get rid of the beam. So at the moment, NMAP security, one beam dump, attackers, zero beam dumps. Then we have to find the proper balance, which is my next challenge. Running the LHC safely is the most important um, thing, because this means you do not have destruction of the x rater The second priority is availability. You would like to be able to run it in the most efficient way, having as much beam time as you can get. If you don't have beam time, you just run the LHC longer. But this is something which we do not want to have. Security is third, which also means that um, I have to monitor all over the place. At the moment, I'm taking one terabyte of security data every day. This amount of terabyte, I cannot analyze manually. This is completely impossible. So again, we have this delegation. Remember, we're delegating security. What we're doing is we're analyzing automatically the traffic. We're analyzing automatically the computer clusters. If we find something which is matching our signatures, you get an email. We got a portal, and we have automatic information. So this is something from the office network. This is more or less saying that this device um, seems to be infected by some adware. Please run malware bytes. And you can go to the action list here. And since you're responsible, it's your laptop, it's your device, it's your responsibility, and this is giving you some help to fix your problem yourself. 
If you have a vulnerable web page, you get another portal thing. If you've got something like a file space where your SSH key, your private SSH key is public, you get another screen. If you're running your control systems, which is not patched and so on, you get another screen helping you to solve your problem yourself. If you scroll down the page, which you can't, there's also a button, give me some help, and this is where the security team is kicking in. This is how we can master one terabyte of data every day. Elsewise, we can't. And again, we got safety systems. The good thing with the safety systems is they will kick in if something is, is ad hoc, if something is wrong. There are dozens of safety systems which are all independently monitoring the state of the machine, which means that if something is going wrong, more or less the safety systems are kicking in, the beam is dumped, and then getting something like a one gigabyte file of post-mortem information telling you why was the beam kicked out, which system triggered, and uh, the operator's job is then to understand what went wrong, how did it went wrong, and was it now something like an attack? never happened so far, or was it something, some, some spurious signal on one of the PLCs, or something else, a power glitch, something else. Last but not least, every country on this map is sending people to CERN. Every country which is not white. So you can see we got um, something like 10,000 people on site being sent from the university, the institute, from any of those countries to CERN for working at CERN for a limited period of time. We get control system experts, lots of them. They are brilliant guys for control systems, but not for security. We are hiring IT freshmen for the IT department, for the beams department, programmers, software developers, software designers, software architects. Brilliant guys. We're, taking, we're trying to take the best. But they're not getting security curriculum by default. If they have the bachelor, they have learned how to design databases, web pages, operating systems, and so on. They have learned how to do system administration. But what they haven't learned is how to do this securely. I'm talking with the professors, and they tell me, yeah, you know, Stefan, bachelor means setting up databases. Master means setting up databases in a secure fashion. You see something is wrong here. This is, this is, this is all at all. We're doing a security conference. I've never heard about an availability conference. Why do we do this? Because security somehow is apart. I'm waiting for the moment that students in IT, in control systems, are learning security from the very beginning. How you do setting up a web server in a secure fashion from the very, very start, and not just plugging on top of that. But this is the reality I'm facing, and I'm seeing lots and lots of students again and again and again, and they tell me, I need to have some security training. It's still saying two minutes 50, so um, let's use them. Here we are, training. We have done the Kaspersky Industrial Protection uh, Simulator, and uh, I think Slava will tell us more about this uh, later on the day. We're doing some white hat uh, challenges, so we are now educating our users themselves, giving or doing penetration testing on our systems. So here I am, my recap. I hope I was able to convey to you that um, we get a one-time prototype, which is unique, which makes my life very, very difficult, and uh, we have an agile and permanent development on this device. So I cannot have, I cannot deny access to all of my developers to the system. My second challenge is we have a high com complexity, which makes it very difficult for us to put some choke points in between, some monitoring points. On the other hand, this complexity makes also for an attacker and adversary very, very difficult to penetrate the system and do some, some, some bad action. Worldwide access is needed. And last but not least, availability counts. This is why we've delegated the security to everybody else who is running control systems. I am just a facilitator, an enabler, helping those people to do their job in a secure fashion. Training, audits, penetration testing. And last but not least, here we are. Training is essential, and I think this is where we should start. Security for me is a communication problem, a transparency problem, and a problem of people. Technology comes second. Thank you very much.